From the language of Babel, this is Multilinguish. I'm Elin Asklöv. When I worked in the Babel headquarters in Berlin, I used to speak three languages on a daily basis, English, German and Swedish. This made me aware of a phenomenon that still fascinates me, and it's called code switching. I became interested in why I would feel the need to switch so much between languages, while others would manage to stick to one. Code switching is defined as alternating between two languages or dialects within one conversation. It can be single words or phrases that you insert into the other language, or it can be several sentences in one language, suddenly followed by switching to another, and then back again. This is all very natural to bilinguals, and with 20% of all US residents speaking another language at home, we can assume that code switching is an incredibly common activity, but it's something that's often puzzling to monolinguals. On today's episode of Multilinguish, we'll explore why and how people switch between languages. But before we get started, make sure to rate and review Multilinguish wherever you listen. And don't forget to subscribe so you get new episodes as soon as they're released. Today, I'm first speaking with two bilingual colleagues about how they handle language switching on a daily basis. And we'll hear some insights from experts about how the bilingual brain works. Then we will discuss what switching says about a speaker. Why do you do it? And is it good or bad? To talk about code switching today, I have members of Babel's content team here with me, Ruben Villas and Diana Tour. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. Good. Thanks for having us. So, um, you both speak two languages, right? Or even more? Yeah, a bit more. I yeah. mean, I speak two languages really well and then a few more not that well. Yeah, maybe. same for me. <laughs> yeah. And how many would you say that you speak daily? Uh, two, yeah. I yeah, speak yeah. two. Yeah. Every yeah. day. Spanish and English. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's Portuguese and English. So what is your experience of uh, switching between languages? I mean, mine is every weekend I just speak Portuguese normally. I mean, I do speak mm. English when I go to the supermarket or something. But I will just speak Portuguese to my wife. And then on Monday when I come to work, I normally won't know how to speak English for <laughs> the first like 40 minutes. <laughs> but then I'll get into it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for me it's like very frustrating because I only speak Spanish when when I see a friend or when I call someone that speaks Spanish, my family or friends, stuff like that. But at home I speak English and work, I also speak English. So it's basically like my life is in English all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you often feel the need to to switch when you're speaking the one language that you will feel, ah, oh, I wish I could say this, or that you even speak to someone who, I mean, uh, for instance, at home, Ruben, that you would s- switch to English sometimes, or is it pure Portuguese? No, uh, actually, I, I do uh, forget a, a lot like uh, Portuguese words when yeah. I'm talking to my wife, uh, and this happens to her as well, and uh, we just remember like how you say that in English. Yeah. Like normally, th- I mean, it's just like, you know, everyday words that we just, it, it just goes away <laughs> for some reason. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we, I think we do speak lots of English at home too, but not le- not like uh, in like actual sentences. It's just like this word and that word. They just come easier to us because we speak English most of the time anyways. Yeah. yeah. You would feel like that word is what pops up in your brain. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. And sometimes w- and sometimes we'll just be th- there for a minute, like both of us trying to think like, how do you say this word in Portuguese? Mm. And then <laughs> none of us can remember and it just comes to us like 20 minutes later or something. Uh, yeah. It's funny when you forget your yeah. native language. Yeah. The same thing happens to me. Like I have to... I am Actually, when I speak Spanish to my friends, it's more like Spanglish than yeah. Spanish. Because mm-hmm. there is so many words that actually don't exist in Cuba, you know? Yeah. So we have to use the English word to describe whatever we're talking about. So it's like, it is mainly Spanish, but a lot of English words. Yeah. And the other thing is that right now, I don't speak a lot of Spanglish. But when I was living in Miami for like three years... It was a lot of Spanglish all the time. Like, basically, people talk, like, switching from one language to the other all the time. Yeah. And it's really crazy. And I think that happens because they they are not very good at Spanish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but they want to speak it and they want to prove that they 
that they're part of the culture and all that stuff. So they they really want to put some words out there, you know. Especially I feel that from the children of immigrants that were born here and then they had to, you know, adapt to the new culture that is not the same culture than, the, than their parents. So they want to keep the two things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've learned that that's a very common reason why you code switch, that you want to show belonging to a group and you want to show uh, solidarity with a, with a certain group. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it's also just that w- some, some words or phrases or expressions might feel more right to you at the moment for yeah, one yeah, reason definitely. or the other. Um, so, I, I mean, my ideal situation is always to be... Or like when I feel like I'm the most myself is when I am with people who have my exact language combination, basically English, German, and Swedish, because then I can say whatever first pops <laughs> into my head. Mm-hmm. Um, and I became very curious about all of this, and I was wondering if it was an, a common experience. Um, so I went to Berlin and talked to some of Babel's language experts about bilingualism and code switching. And yeah, so we can listen to what they said about how the bilingual brain works. Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm an instructional designer here at Babbel, and I have a background in empirical and theoretical linguistics. Hi, I'm Michaela. Um, I'm a project manager here at Babbel, and I have a background in psycholinguistics. Hi, and I'm Todd Erisman. I'm originally from Minnesota, and my background is in Germanic linguistics and sociolinguistics, and uh, I work here at Babbel as a lead in the didactics department. Um, So I did my PhD exactly on this topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was about language switching, although it was more kind of forced language switching. Indeed, we can be forced, so to say, like now, in which I have to speak in English. Maybe I would prefer to say these all things in Italian, but I can't. Um, And a more voluntary language switching in which people, as you were saying in your situation, like, you know, those people understand your languages. So English, uh, German and Swedish in your case. So you feel free just to choose the words or the the, the language that you prefer. And from science, we know that it is um, costly. So it's an effort to change the language. And even if you're forced, this kind of comes like like a logic consequence, you kind of know, okay, if I'm forced to change something, it's going to cost me something. Uh, But surprisingly, it seems that also when we are free to choose, still there is a kind of cost. It's not that easy. And um, the reason is that we know we have uh, all those languages in our mind and somehow um, it's not that we have like a magic mental device and we can decide, okay, now I'm switching these words off or this language off and I'm turning this on. It's much more complex because all those words and all those languages are kind of interconnected and you have mm. to find a way to, um, to not to get all the things mixed up. Okay. And this yeah. takes uh, a lot of effort. Yeah. I feel like sometimes I feel like it's really I have to push something down and then search actively for another thing. Is that sort of how it, what happens yeah, in the brain? Yeah. Exactly. So now the what we know from science, the current model is that we do as bilingual or multilingual speaker, we do inhibit the language or the words that we don't want to use and mm-hmm. we activate a bit more the one that we want to use. So and all this inhibition <coughs> is a cost. It's, it doesn't come for, for, from for free. And um, yes, so this is, okay, I need to choose. <coughs> and uh, as you were saying, okay, I need to push this back because now I, I don't want to say this. And on the other side, for example, when you um, you know, okay, I can speak in whatever language because those people are going to understand me. So I'm just speaking up the word that in that moment is more active in my mind. It is easier for me to find. Mm. So I'm not really... Um, like inhibiting and searching a new thing is like the new thing is coming to me because it's so active. For example, I've just heard the word uh, and it's so active in my mind that I'm using this again. So there the cost is going to be a bit smaller because it's already there, the word that I want to use. Hmm. There's been some really interesting <coughs> neurolinguistic uh, imaging studies that give some feedback um, or at least give us some idea of how robust those connections are um, when you do have multiple languages in the brain. And it 
depends a little bit on how balanced a bilingual um, a speaker is. Because if someone has learned a second language earlier in life, you'll see that those connections are much stronger. Um, and we also see, I mean, physically in the, in the brain, different areas activate uh, when you're speaking one language or the other. Um, so one of the things that we can just sort of try out, if you are bilingual, um, you get this idea of a cost in terms of suppression of a language and then the cost of activating a new language. Um, just take a bus ride or a train ride and try to not pay attention to the conversations that are going on around you. It's much more challenging and costly to not pay attention to your stronger language. So usually your mother, you know, whatever yeah. your mother tongue is, it's much more difficult to suppress that than it is to sort of turn off the other languages. So when I've been in Poland, I can absolutely ignore everyone around me who's <laughs> speaking Polish. But if someone, just one person is speaking English, it's almost impossible for me to ignore that conversation because it's more costly for me to suppress my, my first language than it is my second or third languages. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about this? The other day I was on the subway and there were these two ladies talking about talking in Spanish about how they clean their uh, bosses tops <laughs> they were saying no I don't clean the top every week I just clean it like once a month or something like that <laughs> <laughs> and they were speaking in Spanish next to me and I was like looking at them like what <laughs> really <laughs> and it was so hard to avoid to you know look at them and be part of that conversation and at some point they said something like why is this gringa looking at us like that <laughs> <laughs> and i had to tell them like no the problem is that i i speak spanish you know so it's impossible for me not to yeah. listen to your conversation and pay full attention to what you're saying yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's very funny all the time like uh, on the train, if I hear someone speaking Portuguese, e e even if it's like Brazilian Portuguese, like uh, my my antenna will just, you know, pop up and I'm like, okay, I'm, now I'm listening. Like, I know what's happening. Yeah. And if someone's speaking Spanish next to me, like, I will understand it, but, uh, you know, I will, I will kind of ignore it. Same for English. But yeah, if Portuguese, even if it's like very far, I'm like, oh, wait, there's someone there. Like, I can hear it mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. And it even happens to me with the accents because, you know, in New York, there is so many people that speak Spanish. But when I hear a Cuban accent of someone on the street or something like that, I automatically turn like, who are you? Do I know you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's really interesting because that is the reason why we do this is because it doesn't cost us anything yeah. brain power wise mm -hmm. to listen to a conversation in our native language, whereas it costs us so much more to listen to. Um, to another language and it also costs us much more to speak another language yeah, yeah definitely yeah. I also asked the people in Berlin if there's any difference when you add a third language in the mix um, what we can see then in the brain uh, because Michaela speaks Italian English and German, Todd speaks English, German and is learning Dutch and Jenny has Polish as a third language mm -hmm. so uh, we can hear what they say about what they said about that I've learned that there is a difference between bilinguals and people that speak more than two languages because, of course, if you just have two languages in your mind, of course, the source of interference is going to come from your native language, for mm. your, from your first language. There is no other source. But if you speak more than two languages, then it becomes a bit more complex. And what is observed is that very often the foreign languages, so the languages that we learn later in life, tend to mix up t more mm. than uh, your native language. It's kind of, they are qualitatively different. One is your native language, is well established, you have learned this from uh, early on, from your birth. Um, so it's, it has like a kind of different stages in your mind, in your brain, and it's easier to put this aside while for the newly learned languages, they are kind of less stable, uh, they're still forming, and they can get like mixed up. And the more similar 
um, those two languages are, the foreign languages, the more difficult, it, it seems, that it's more difficult to keep them um, uh, apart. For example, in your case, told it was Dutch and German, which are very similar languages, typologically similar languages. And in my case, it was English and German. So it can happen with all languages, but the more similar it seems, the more the problem. Yeah, is. that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And... We talked a little earlier about how the languages actually are located a little bit differently in the brain. We can actually see this on um, neuro um, imagings. And one of the things that's interesting is that your native language, when you learn grammar, so not so the basic grammar, but also like function words like ands, the, but, a, et cetera, those tend to be stored in an area um, where we have our procedural memory. So the things that we can do and access um, unconsciously, we don't have to think mm -hmm. about that. And then the vocabulary is stored somewhere else where we have like sort of semantic memory. When we start to add on other languages, both the words and the grammar of the other languages are also stored in our semantic memory, which means that when we are trying to search for um, how to convey some concept we have in our mind, how we can convey that in the next, um, so our non-native language, we are in a sense sort of sorting through not just this huge you know, mental dictionary of all the words, but also the grammar constructions, which includes things like um, the morphosyntactic frames for the words. So in other words, how you make it plural, how you change it if it's a different case or you know that sort of thing. And so it makes it a lot more difficult sometimes. And when you do have some competing forms, um, when languages are very similar, um, it's, it's just a more crowded space in terms of accessing some of that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting because I, I have had some experiences. I mean, obviously, when we talk about code switching, we're talking about producing language. Um, but I've noticed some differences um, sort of along these lines when I'm processing language mm -hmm. in the sense that um, I've, been in, I've been in France, and I, I do speak a little bit of French. It's sort of heritage French from growing up. Um, I don't speak it very well, but spending time in France um, over a, a week and a half, I was able to really start to reactivate some of that French that I literally never use in my daily life. Mm -hmm. And on the very last day of our trip, I was sitting in the train station. I heard an announcement that our train was going to be delayed and on a different track. And I was so proud of myself that I understood the entire announcement in French, bragged about it to my husband. I was 100% sure it was in French. And then my husband told me it was all in German. But it, <laughs> but it was just because I think somehow my brain recognized not English. Um, yeah. And yeah. because I was in France... I assumed it was French, and if I would have put my hand on a Bible and had to swear, I would have told you 100% that I understood something in French, but it was just German. Yeah, what are you thinking about this? This is pretty funny. Has this happened to you at all? Uh, I don't remember a specific instance of um, listening to something and thinking it's a language and it's another one, un unless it's something like languages. I have no idea what they are. Like, I can, I can think it's Swedish and maybe it's Dutch, you know, because I'm not... 100% sure about the differences but uh, but yeah like uh, I do I do have this where sometimes like the word will not come to me neither in English or in uh, Portuguese but it will come to me in German which is very weird yeah. because I'm not really that good at German but it's you know it's there somehow and like my wife she's she's good at German and she will look at me like how do you even you know how does yeah. this came to you like uh, and, yeah, and, and lots of times also Spanish will come to me and French mm. because these, these are all the languages that I've like kind of learned. So there, there's some stuff that will, you know. Yeah. And that's what's so interesting about what they said about this, that they are stored in a different part of the brain than yeah. your first language. At least your first language sort of syntactic basic structure is stored somewhere. And then all of the words like nouns and, you know, verbs from your native language plus everything you ever learned in all of the other languages are just like in a giant sort of yeah. closet where you have to try to find the right <laughs> piece of clothing and yeah. it's like it's getting stressful. For me, it's more like the second thing she said works. It's what really works for me because I, I never confuse English with Spanish. Mm. But I could very easily use an Italian word when I'm speaking Spanish or use a Spanish word when mm. I'm speaking Italian. Or use I have a friend that he's um, Brazilian and he's been with a Cuban for like 20 years. So he speaks really good Cuban um, 
accent, you know, like mm. he has a, a very strong Cuban accent with all the slang words and everything. And sometimes he uses like I've been he's a really good friend of mine. So he uses Portuguese words and sometimes I comparate those Portuguese words to my Spanish too. So it's like it can mix up very easily if it's yeah. if it comes from the same root. Yeah. But at the same time like I don't I don't confuse Spanish words with English that much. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, I do confuse like some Spanish with French. Yeah. But not like like uh, because I'm hearing it, like in my mind I want to like try and think like how does this sound in Spanish? And sometimes some French words will come to me and I'm like is this Spanish or is this French? Like I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes also w- my my Italian is good, but it's not great great you know so sometimes if i need a word i would just put the spanish word there and think that yeah that's totally italian but it's not you yeah know? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah it's very funny in that way yeah and i guess from a code switching perspective it's also that's why it c- can feel so um you can you can sort of feel so free with someone who understands both languages yeah, that you yeah. can switch back and forth and you don't have to concentrate that much mm-hmm. and i think that's that's partly why it happens, but it's also like a, a choice, a uh, stylistic choice to, yeah. to show that you belong somewhere or to use a word that it's more precise to you and, yeah. and something like that. When I speak, sp- when I'm speaking English and some word that, you know, comes from the Spanish language comes up, I try to pronounce it as much as I can in the Spanish accent, right? Mm-hmm. For example, I don't say burrito. I say burrito. Yeah. <laughs> that would be weird though, right? Exactly. <laughs> like that, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, people expect you to use exactly the, the, the words the same way they use them. But for me, it's like, it wouldn't make any sense in my mind to use words like that in English, you know? Yeah. So. There's also a phenomenon that only happens to me here. Because in Portugal, I feel like we have Portuguese words for most words. So we don't have lo- lots of like uh, I don't know how, how you call them, but like uh, words that come from from English, basically that we adopted. Mm. We don't have many of those. Yeah. So in Portugal, we just speak Portuguese, like uh, you know, almost one hundred percent without those. And I feel like when I'm here, and I have like uh, a friend who's a flight attendant, so he comes to New York lots of times, and I hang out with him. And I feel like I s- I use so many English expressions now. And he sometimes even makes a bit fun of me. Mm. But it's like, uh, you know, like it's a kind of a mixture. It's like uh, Spanglish, basically, mm-hmm. but for Portuguese, I think. It's just this, like, I'm talking Portuguese and then I just say something in English. And it's, you know, it's completely natural for me. And yep. for him, it's like, oh, you mean this? And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> but yeah. in English. Yeah. No, exactly. This is very really the, the essence of, of code switching. Yeah. And I see that a lot, or I, I hear that a lot when I listen to... Um, Swedish radio and podcasts that they mm. will throw in a lot of English words, not even English loan words, but just words. Yeah. They would they would switch just like um, you know the general um, sort of how how we understand code switching as opposed to loan words because yeah. it's slightly different. Um, even though their entire audience speaks Swedish, yeah, and yeah. that's also an interesting thought. Like, why do they do that? But that's probably because they want to convey some s- mm. sort of feeling of them being international, and it yeah. can just be that some words are better in English. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, I definitely feel that some words work a lot better in English because they have yeah, this in like they have this specific meaning. For example, the word "cute." We have words for that in Spanish, but it's we don't have an exact one, you know. We yeah. have like, for example, lindo, yeah, or bonito, but we don't have an, a specific word for cute. So I feel like that's a word that whenever I'm speaking Spanish and I'm referring to that, I use the English word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, that happens to me a lot. Also, I don't think we have a good Swedish word or German for embrace. Mm. Mm. So I think the embrace. <laughs> 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 it's like tr- sort of integrated also into the yeah. language. Yeah, that's cool. So. Uh, yeah, thank you for um, sharing. We will be back after a short break and then we will um, talk about what code switching says about the language proficiency of a speaker. Mm-hmm. Um, but first, we'll have a little break. Multilinguish is brought to you by Babbel, the language app. 
Babbel is the app that gets you speaking quickly and with confidence. Choose from 14 languages, including Spanish, French, and Italian. So Dylan, are you taking any big trips this year? Funny you ask, Steph. I'm actually going to Paris this year. Um, I'm very excited about it, but I know zero French. Um, so I have been... Zero? Z- well, I know bonjour. Okay. Um, so I've been using the Babbel app I just started to try to get some basic French down before I go. Obviously, I'm hitting all the food words because that will be the most important part of my trip. Um, but I'm very excited to use some new French skills when I'm there. That's super exciting. Um, and what's also exciting is we're offering multilingual listeners 50% off a three-month subscription. New customers can get this offer by visiting babbel.com slash podcast. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash podcast. Now back to the show. And we're back. Um, speaking with me about code switching today are Ruben and Diana. Hello again. So I was wondering what if we imagine a person who switch a lot back and forth or even who just inserts a lot of, say, um, Spanish words in their English or vice versa. Um, what do you think that says about the language proficiency of the speaker? I think it says this person has a good language proficiency because it, this person is able to, you know, just switch really quickly. So it's... Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can do that with English and Portuguese, like, extremely easily. Mm-hmm. But I, ca- I, I don't think I can do that with other languages. No. I, I think I can actually uh, mix Spanish with Portuguese. But this is a old costume, uh, no, uh, old custom that Portuguese people have. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we uh, Spain is, a, is our neighboring country. And, you know, sometimes we just don't know the Spanish words. So we just, like, uh, do, like... Uh, Portuguese word Portuñol. With, yeah, Portuñol, exactly. With uh, with a Portuguese word with a Spanish accent, you know, and hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I can I can I can switch easily with yeah. English, but like with German like uh, it's impossible. Mm-hmm. It's with Spanish, uh, you know, with Spanish is not the same. It's not switching, it's just mixing. And yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, I but it's different like uh, to switch it it just mean I think for me it just means that you know these languages. The, both of these are your mother tongues in a, in a way. Like yeah. English is also my mother tongue because I've sp- I've spoken English since I was like five years old. Mm-hmm. And um, and German, not really. You know, German is just there. Like yeah. uh, in Spanish, the same. They're like parked in my brain, and sometimes s- stuff will pop out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. No, I totally agree with what you were saying. Uh, but at at some point, I've met people that they really have to switch because they don't know the mm. words mm-hmm. yeah. or they just don't come to them you know yeah. so sometimes like like the example i was saying at the beginning that i feel like some people some um you know people that they were born in the states but they they want to speak spanish or their parents speak spanish they don't always have like the specific word that they're looking for and then they have to they have to use the English yeah, word yeah. it's not that they want to you know it's that they have to because mm-hmm. they don't have anything else to express that thing that they want to say yeah so it could vary from one thing to the other yeah yeah, yeah. I asked the same question to uh, Todd and Jenny and Michaela um, basically is switching a sign of lacking proficiency in one language let's hear I think there's kind of stages of code switching in that regard. Um, when you're a beginner, you use code switching as a, as a method of getting around your mm-hmm. uh, deficiencies in, in that second language. Uh, but as your proficiency increases to a certain point, you start to get into uh, what we were discussing earlier, this sort of using it as, as an expression of freedom with uh, a, a cohort of people that have the same languages as you do. Um, so I can remember, of course, one of the strategies when you, when you're learning a language like German and you're missing a, a piece of vocabulary is just throw in the English word most Germans will probably <laughs> get it and mm. uh, and you keep going um, and as you improve your proficiency you kind of remove those those crutches if you want to call them that um, uh, as you get better and then you kind almost come out the other end uh, when you reach a certain level of proficiency and are able to code switch consciously in a in a way that is a stylistic choice as opposed to a, a, a way of um, covering up your, your lack of vocab. 
Yeah, yeah, I've kind of just noticed the same that at the beginning when people are like the, um, still beginners or so, um, that the switching are mostly unintentional that just come and sometimes you have some kind of blending. So you are putting words coming from two different languages together and you create new words that do not exist. This is um, like this kind of creation. And then with time, this happens less and less and less. And then as Todd was saying, you were saying, then you just manage to have control and to choose when, and you know when it is appropriate to use that language or not. I just want to say just briefly that um, on the brain level, um, at least what it goes about inhibition and all of the things that we have talked at the beginning, we don't really see much of a difference mm -hmm. on between early um, like um, beginners and advanced. Only the intensity is, is, is different, but the mental processes actually do not change. Mm. Yeah, I know when I was learning German, because I didn't actually start learning German until I was 35 years old, so I'm definitely a late bilingual mm. um, in that case. But I would often uh, inten intentionally code switch um, to cover up for my vocabulary deficiencies. Um, so like a lot of code switching, there's generally a, a, you know, whatever is the dominant language in that environment, usually you keep sort of the grammatical structure, the morphosyntactic structure, that mm -hmm. sort of thing, and you're switching out vocabulary. Um, I tried to be tricky by just pronouncing English words the way I think a German would pronounce it. <laughs> and luckily, generally, it's pretty close. Um, that didn't work so well when I learned Polish. <laughs> but um, that's something that, you know, you see in, as a, a marker maybe of someone who has sort of emerging um, bilingual proficiency. Mm -hmm. um, and then it becomes potentially then a, a bit more deliberate and more, as Todd said, a stylistic choice um, mm -hmm. as your proficiency level advances. And I think it's very interesting also how how they stress and also in all the things that I read about code switching that it is in most cases a conscious choice um, at when you come to a certain level of, of your second language. Um, and it's a very natural thing and makes you wonder a little bit what the what the reasons are um, to do it. I've learned that there are a few factors to why you would uh, code switch. And one is that um, a certain language is more tied to a certain area of your life. And that makes it um, a lot easier to talk about that area of your life in that language. So the case for us and for a lot of um, other like migrants in the United States is that they have one home language and one um, work language language yeah. and yeah. then it becomes sort of difficult to talk about work life in your home language that's true and that's it true. can become difficult to talk about uh, your home life in english like there are so many household appliances i have no idea what they're called in english <laughs> <laughs> what's a colander i don't know i don't know too well I don't <laughs> <laughs> what is it though? <laughs> <laughs> i still don't know i think it's a drainer like you drain your colador. Uh, oh so that's easy for you yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> For me, what happened is that I actually learned all the my professional words that I use mm. in English, you yep. know, because I went to film school in English. Mm -hmm. So I, a lot of the time, I, when I'm trying to work with people that only speak Spanish, I have a really hard time because I don't know how to use those words in Spanish. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No, that happens. And I have a few Swedish friends here also who um, work, of course, entirely in English. Mm -hmm. And whenever they start to talk about their work, they immediately switch to English. And that mm -hmm. makes me switch as well because, you know, something in my brain says, oh, now we're speaking English. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, 10 minutes later, we look at each other and like, why, why are we speaking English? We're both yeah, Swedish. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Like, I feel like I have a hard time describing stuff I do at work in Portuguese to my friends. Yeah. But at the same time, like when I tell this stuff to my wife, it comes out somehow. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. It can also be situational. Uh, yeah, that's true. A lot of times. I yeah. mean, but but it's true because with my wife, like, uh, you know, it's the typical, like uh, when you have a partner, you come home mm. and you talk about your day and what you do. I mean, mm. not always, but most, most days. And yeah, with my friends, I feel like it's different. Yeah. It's like they are not... Uh, aware of what's happening at my job like uh, what's my day to day so it mm -hmm. feels harder to describe in portuguese like uh, 
what I do. Not what I do, but, uh, you know, what I've been doing yeah. you know, for the past week or so. Yeah, yeah your wife knows. <laughs> yeah, my wife <laughs> knows. Like I, tell, I tell her, like, we talk during the day and I tell her, like, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So she's kind of aware, so it mm-hmm. just comes out somehow. Yeah. Another reason why you switch languages is because a lot of people have the f- just a feeling that it's easier to talk about emotions in your native language. And mm-hmm. I think you, Diana, were talking in another episode about... Uh, going to the therapy in English, how that's uh, a very foreign thought. Yeah, no, I would never do that. (laughs) There's no way. (laughs) I mean, I did it, and uh, I felt it was okay. Yeah. I felt it was hard to, uh, yeah, sometimes gather the words. Yeah. Like the necessary words to explain it. And and sometimes I felt felt like I was uh, exaggerating, not on purpose. Mm-hmm. Because I would say, uh, "Oh, this I f- uh, this happened to me," or and it would sound way worse than it was, and mm. and then I would have to wait, but not really like this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me let me explain it a little bit more, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think it's it can be a tricky situation, but uh, but I also think it's fine. It's ju- should be that that like uh, first barrier, because you know you want to talk about personal stuff about your feelings. Mm. And yeah, that's the first thing you want to do is in Portuguese. But, uh, you know, it should be very hard. Yeah. I mean, it, for me, it should be very hard to find a Portuguese therapist in New York. I probably, yeah. didn't, <laughs> I probably didn't want one, you know. No. I probably just, you know, just want someone that's qualified. And, you know, stuff will, it, it will work out in the end. It's like, uh, you know, it's like work. Like, even if you don't speak English that well, like, it's going to work out. Just, uh, yeah gonna be okay no, i believe so too but a lot of people also report that um it adds a specific l- it adds a certain layer of uh, distance yeah. to talk yeah. about things in in another language than your native language yeah that's the way i feel actually it's not that i wouldn't be able to translate my feelings exactly you know because probably i could but i i feel like there is a level of comfortness that i have in my own language that i and I can be very specific with everything I want to say. And in English, sometimes it's not even that I don't find the words. Sometimes it's just that the words don't exist, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. It feels like it's like you're re- reporting something. Exactly. Instead of just talking about it. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. Spanish is like, we have, it's so rich. We have so many words for everything. And sometimes yeah. like you have one word for something in English and then... Ten words for the same thing in Spanish. And not only ten words that mean exactly the same. It's ten words that have specific meaning inside that one other meaning that there is just one word in English. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if yeah. I explain myself. Mm. No, that, <laughs> no hap- that happens with Portuguese as well. Like so many words and then their English counterparts are a lot of times the same words. So yeah. 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 But I can also sometimes feel when I'm speaking Swedish that I want to say a German word. Because mm. that is super specific to me and has a very, it's really on point and it has the exact perfect connotations for what yeah. I want to to tell someone about. And then they don't speak German, so I can't say that word. So it's yeah. kind of, it can be frustrating. I think that was my, my issue with learning German. Like I was never very keen on learning German just because it's a, it's a language that somehow does not agree with me. You know, in my mind, I don't feel like comfortable speaking German. But I also feel like that specificity that Germans have also like seemed like a hurdle to me when I was learning it. Yeah. Because, you know, Portuguese, I know Portuguese. Spanish, it's very close, so also easy. And English, that like uh, English vocabulary is not that extensive compared to Portuguese, so also seemed easy. And German seemed like all of those together. <laughs> 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 and, and then some, you know, like... Uh, yeah. So many specific words for all situations. Even like when you're learning German, you you like uh, they will teach you like these like the longest German words, and they're like the most specific thing you never thought anyone would need. You <laughs> know, like uh, I also asked the language experts in Berlin what some other triggers for code switching are. Well, from science, um, we know, for example, that uh, we tend to 
no, I don't want to say to copy other people, but what happens is that, for example, let's say you are talking to me and you're suddenly using a word in German, then you are kind of priming me. You're, I'm activating this because I listen to you. And then for me, it's going to be easier to repeat this word than searching for the other word in the other language. So this is called priming in science. Um, so I guess why um, this can explain sometimes why when a person starts with this also small code switching, just putting some words from other languages, it might happen that the person who is talking to you would repeat the words in the same language just because you heard this before. Maybe he wouldn't do this if he would speak with another person that does not code switch. Yeah, if you think about it from the more pragmatic perspective, the whole reason to have a conversation is to make yourself understood and to understand someone else. And we very often um, do things unconsciously to build rapport with the people we're speaking with. And so we may change our, our cadence, we may change our intonation, we may change the type of, you know, the level of the register with which we are speaking. Um, and code switching is one way of doing that. So we might not even realize necessarily that we are switching in this way. So not just switching in terms of languages, but also switching in terms of the, sort of the register um, that we're choosing to speak in. It's just uh, a way of forging connections, building solidarity with the people that we're speaking with, um, and ultimately trying to have a, a good conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting also what you say about um, showing solidarity uh, within a group, because um, code switching also just doesn't happen from one language to another, right? It also happens within one language, different dialects and uh, and socialects. Um, what what do we know about that? Well, again, from science, uh, what we know is that, for example, the mental mechanisms that take place when we switch between what we call two languages, like English and German are actually the same uh, that take place when we switch between a dialect and a certain language. So it's also another topic, like w how we define a language, how we define a dialect. Mm -hmm. In any case, at the cognitive level, we don't really see um, much difference between uh, switching between two register or a dialect and language and two languages. Um, yeah. Yeah, I we think, think oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it's interesting here to think about uh, maybe the historical view, how, how people have viewed code switching over time. Um, and historically speaking, people have viewed it as a, more of a negative thing. It's, as you said, it, it, there is a, a mental and a, and a cognitive cost to doing so. Um, at the same time, it affords all kinds of advantages. So if we think about dialect and sociolect code switching, um, it simply allows you to navigate more situations and to belong in more situations. Yeah, I feel like this is a very important part of code switching that we haven't touched that much upon, but it's also, of course, as they say, happen um, within dialects um, or like from a dialect to a to more formal type of language. Um, one of the most prominent examples here in the U.S. is, of course, uh, African-American vernacular English and uh, a sort of more formal English. However, people would perceive formal English, but like more of a standardized English. Mm. And there, the social advantages of code switching become very ev evident as well. That you can show, you can belong to more situations, more groups. Yeah. You can, you know, sort of travel between <laughs> one thing and the other. Yeah, yeah. And also, of course, other dialects. Uh, I mean, all languages have dialects that are not part of the sort of formal standardized language and the ability to switch between them is something that just like opens up a lot of doors for people yeah yeah i feel like for example the the same i don't speak with my cuban friends the same spanish that i speak with my other friends that speak spanish from other countries you know yeah whenever i'm not speaking with a cuban i totally have to change the way i speak because I cannot use any of the slang words that I would usually mm -hmm. use. So I have to use a more general Spanish, neutral, so everyone can understand me. Yeah. And I have, for example, a very good Chilean friend, and I had to learn a lot of Chilean slang so I could communicate with her in a way that she would feel more comfortable and more open, you know? Yeah. So I don't know if that happens to you with Portuguese. Um, I don't think so. I think it's different. I mean, for Portuguese, there's not a lot. You know, there's European Portuguese, there's Brazilian Portuguese, and there's some places in Africa where they also speak Portuguese. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, for me, like I feel like my Portuguese is normally all the same. Like uh, I talk, I mean, it's not the same, the same, but because I do not talk to my mom the way I talk to my friends, though it's not that far, you know. Mm-hmm. But I do feel like my English is different. Like the way I talk at work, uh, it's mm, it's probably different. Like uh, the way I talk when I'm like in Brooklyn, like in my neighborhood, mm-hmm. and I'm talking to people like in the stores and whatever. Um, I mean, it's not not that different, but I feel like it's more relaxed. Like uh, even like when I'm at work, but I'm it's like lunch. I feel like my English is way more relaxed. Like uh, you know, I can make crack jokes. Mm-hmm. And it's not like I don't crack jokes like when in a work situation. It's just like that my main goal uh, is to, you know, be understood, like uh, make sure yeah. people know what I'm saying, uh, make sure I don't sound like uh, because it's not my first language. So I don't want to sound like I don't know, don't know what I'm talking about, you know. Mm-hmm. So my first goal is to like be very forward and be very specific and just show them like, you know. Uh, not lo- not that I, this is like my goal that I want to show people that language is not a barrier, <laughs> but at the same time it's in the back of my mind that uh, you know. Yeah, like I think uh, that's inevitable for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, like uh, in the same time space, I will, you know, we'll go to lunch in the common area, and uh, you know, like uh, it's like my guard is down, kind of. Yeah. Not re- not not mm-hmm. so not so as strong as that, but you know, I just relax. And it's the same when, like, uh, when I leave the office, when I'm outside, you know, it's like the work day is over, so uh, I don't need to be extremely focused on the way I, s- uh, I say things, so people will understand me at first. Like, if someone doesn't understand me in the street, it's fine. Like, I'll just repeat it. Yeah. Not not a big deal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think what Jenny said also, I mean, it's that s- speaking is first and foremost a very social thing, yeah. and we unconsciously just take into account who we're talking to and which type of register we yeah, exactly. can use with that person and so mm-hmm. on. You you don't talk to the a five year old the same way you talk to your boss, even if it's the same yeah, language or dialect or yeah. so I mean I think in a sense we're all code switching. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. I mean now that I think of it, like when I go to New Jersey, I will normally go to Newark because there's a big Portuguese community there and oh. I, And I will go there once in a while, like uh, to buy some stuff in the Portuguese supermarket and to basically eat, like because there will be Portuguese food, like Mm. lots of it. And I do feel like the way I talk to the people there, and they're all Portuguese, you know, like uh, it's like a big Portuguese community there. I feel like that's different. Like uh, the way I talk to them, I try to be a bit more polite, a Mm. bit more correct. And when I'm with my friend, you know, like uh, with my friends, I just, you know, curse a lot, (laughs) mostly. But yeah, I feel like there's this code switching when I am at that area because it is Portuguese people, but, uh, you know, I don't know them. So I'm kind of like, you know, like uh, trying to show them I'm one of them, but at the same time, like be respectful, you know, yeah. just yeah. like talk like in, in a different way. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I think we've established that code switching is a very natural thing that is used to show solidarity. It's used to show who you are. Um, because your your heart sort of speaks your first language. That can yeah. also be a reason to switch, uh, or situational switching. Um, and I think that Todd said it quite nicely when he talked about um, belonging uh, and different identities that you had, um, which was an anecdote from uh, visiting the sort of capital of linguistic diversity, which is the w- very city we're sitting in right now. Oh. Mm. <laughs> one of the more fun uh, code switching uh, situations that I experienced when I went to to New York City and I'm kind of obsessed with bagels I'm a baker and so Mm. I I created this tour of all of the most famous bagel places in New York City and uh, the first one that I walked into was this hole in the wall I can't even remember the name of it but um, amazing bagels and the first thing that that I heard when I walked in was this amazing 50-50 50-50 mix of language uh, and it was uh, one of the owners of the of the bagel shop doing some kind of business deal. I knew what it was about because there was some English mixed in there and I it was it was English and Yiddish and Hebrew uh, mm. being code switched three three ways 
and and it was such an incredible blend of language that I I couldn't even pay attention to getting in line for the bagel or buying things. So I literally just sat next to him as he was on the phone, <laughs> tried not to interrupt his phone call, but just listened. And um, I think, yeah, I think I just find code switching such a fascinating um, way to express the the various identities that you belong to. And, and New York City is one of these classic places where people's identities are so often split, blended, uh, you know, one slightly stronger than the other. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, I just remember being super fascinated by that story. For me, I speaking Spanglish is actually a lot of fun. Yeah. Because I feel like you're proving your brain that you can switch from one thing to the other and be more specific about things when you're, you know, when you just want to explain yourself in a really great great way yeah it's, you don't only have the tools of one language you have the tools of two languages so you can have as much fun as you want saying anything you want so exactly i think that's also the the main takeaway from code switching that it's like it's it's a way to be i don't know yeah, just to, like you said to express yourself in the most accurate and coolest and best way yeah <laughs> Thank you very much for being on this episode, Ruben and Diana. Thank you for having yeah, us. Yeah, thank you. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for listening. This was our last episode of the season, but stay tuned for bonus material. Uh, thank you all. And bye. 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 Multilinguish is produced by the content team at Babbel. We are Thomas Moore Devlin, David Duchin, Steph Koifman, Dylan Lyons, and I'm Jen Jordan. Ruben Vilesh makes us sound good. Our logo was designed by Ali Zhao. You can read more about today's episode topic and more on Babbel Magazine. Just visit B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash magazine. Say hi on social media by finding us at Babbel USA, all one word. Finally, please rate and review this podcast. We really appreciate it. Colander, noun. A perforated utensil for washing or draining food. Source, Merriam-Webster. See you in season three.